Welcome everyone to another edition of the Dropkick Discussions podcast presented by Sports Kita. I'm your host Corey Guns, and with me again is the number one most trusted name in wrestling reporting, Tom Colahue. Tom, man, it was another uh, eventful week that we've had. A lot of things to discuss. Uh, what, what was some of your initial uh, feelings just on the the week that we've had in wrestling, and now we are full gear heading into uh, Survivor Series. I like that you say full gear heading into Survivor Series, making sure to plug both WWE and AEW in your opening right there. <laughs> yeah, I caught that? you. I caught <laughs> you. Yeah, it's, it's been a, a bit of a crazy week. Again, thank you for the flattery. I certainly wouldn't go that far. I just try and do the best I can, but you do love to flatter. Yeah, we've, we've a lot going on. Ring of Honor had a moment. Uh, Saudi Arabia, obviously, is, is big news, but also NXT appearing from nowhere it's kind of taking the wind out of the sails for full gear a little bit so we'll uh, of course me and you talk about all the big news that's happened and try and fit it in a neat little package for everyone absolutely and and we'll start there i know i it, it's been a little bit since i talked to you i haven't talked to you since uh, crown jewel went down and we're gonna have some takeaways and uh, obviously one big news story coming out of that event uh, that we're going to cover tonight but first let's talk about uh, the Raw that was this past Monday. Um, like I said, we are fully engaged in our build-up to Survivor Series at this point. Uh, we saw the NXT invasion continue last night on the Night Raw um, as we build up the brand war uh, for the November pay-per-view. We saw NXT first invade SmackDown this past Friday, and then, of course, like I said, that continued uh, this past Monday. I, I thought, you know, it, one thing that did kind of strike me as, as interesting is because of all of the the angst around the Saudi Arabia trip, and so a lot of the roster not being able to get back for the SmackDown on this past Friday, a lot of people kind of saw that NXT invasion as maybe just making the best of a bad situation, that since they didn't have a lot of people available for the show, they threw some NXT superstars on there to create some buzz and some surprises for that episode of SmackDown because they really weren't at full strength. And then they continued that and kind of doubled down on that uh, this past Monday on Raw. Do you think that this was has been the plan uh, going forward from the beginning to jumpstart this bill to Survivor Series from this point? Because the announcement was just made at Crown Jewel less than a week ago that NXT was even going to be a part of Survivor Series. So do you think that this was the plan to jump headfirst into the NXT invasion, as it were, um, like it's played out? Or do you think that... They kind of had to pull the trigger a little early on the SmackDown invasion, but because that angle did so well in the ratings, two and a half million people tuned into SmackDown on Friday that they thought, well, hey, let's just keep it going and, and we'll just double down for Raw and then go from there. I wouldn't say it was definitely the plan to present them in the way they did at the time. I don't think it was supposed to be this soon. It's quite telling that for a lot of the NXT talent, they weren't informed that they were needed until quite late in the day. So they had to get there very fast. They were only just arriving at the arena the same time that everybody else was arriving at the arena, by which I mean the fans. So they certainly weren't expected to be used that soon. Then, of course, you've got the UK tours going on at the minute. They'll be going around Europe a little bit more. Um, it wasn't supposed to happen this Friday coming. I'm a SmackDown this Friday. I know they won't plan to be there because that's just a load more people being flown out when they have to get back for the Wednesday show that they now do live. So it wasn't supposed to be this soon. However, if you're going to have Raw versus SmackDown versus NXT, it's got to happen eventually. There is always some sort of invasion. The most famous one, of course, being the one where Becky Lynch got her face accidentally broken. These are huge moments that really draw attention. And on SmackDown, it really did. I think a lot of people may have tuned back in and actually got a, a rating higher than the previous show on the actual main Fox channel because they were expecting a car crash. They were expecting no one to be there, no good matches because no one's had rehearsal time. And what you got was solid entertainment if it was a little light on general story. That's made Survivor Series much bigger straight away. Raw followed up on that. It couldn't quite capitalize. There was a more than 500,000 drop 
in viewership between the first and third hour. So it struggled to keep people. But I think it got more eyes on NXT. It got more excitement for SmackDown. And now, knowing that invasions aren't likely to continue for the next couple of weeks until the go-home show or there or thereabouts, I think they did the best they could with the time that they had. Do you think that that drop in viewership on Raw from the first to the third hour has anything to do with fans feeling like the quote-unquote invasion was just a rehash of what we saw on SmackDown? I mean, I know that it's technically three brands, and so I guess NXT has to invade both shows, Raw and SmackDown, but it did kind of give me the feeling a little bit of, okay, SmackDown had that surprise factor. No one thought NXT was going to show up and especially be featured that prominently uh, on Friday night, so they made the best of a bad situation, got a good rating, and then on Monday, they kind of decided to go down the same road, and it was really the same thing, just with Raw superstars on the other end as compared to SmackDown. So do you, do you think that there was a, maybe a feeling of, you know, already been there, done that for the fans to, you know, to, to tune in, and maybe we why we saw that big drop-off from the first to the third hours, when it was pretty obvious in that first hour that that was the, the track they were going to take was more of this NXT invasion angle. I think you may be onto something there. A lot of it may be down to the reappearance of Brock Lesnar. He gets a lot of casual views. NXT does not. I can't imagine too many people know who Adam Cole is from that casual Raw audience. Which is a shame, and I'm sure with NXT being regularly live now on USA, that will change. But with Fox, you've got people you're not going to see on Fox. You got something new, something fresh, an invasion. On Raw, you didn't get that. You got roughly the same general outline. Instead of attacking, uh, instead of wrestling, I should say, Daniel Bryan, Adam Cole wrestled Seth Rollins. Instead, Triple H did roughly the same thing. Brock Lesnar was at the beginning again. And I think Raw in general is a bit of a daunting show because of that three hours. You now have two alternatives that are two hours long. So if you want to get your NXT fix, you can still just go and watch NXT. Whereas with SmackDown, it was shorter. There was that potential car crash element. So you're more willing to watch the show with the stars that you might not recognize. Well, let's talk about uh, some of the Survivor Series build uh, that was on the Raw show. We actually got three matches that were officially announced for the Survivor Series show. Two of which maybe weren't that big of a surprise, but one that I think, at least for me personally, did take me a little bit by surprise. You had the uh, tag team triple threat, which is going to pit the War Raiders uh, against the Revival, against the Undisputed Era, obviously the tag champions from the three respective brands. The women's... Yeah, yeah, I think it should be really all these matches uh, that we're going to run down, all these triple threats, and there was even one that me and you talked about on Twitter that hasn't been announced, but I hope does get announced eventually. Uh, but we'll talk about that here in a second. But you've got the, the tag team triple threat. You've got the women's triple threat with Becky Lynch, Bailey, and Shayna Baszler. And we saw the, the Baszler-Lynch confrontation on Raw. I'm sure we'll see some some type of... You know, something similar probably with Bailey down the road at some point on SmackDown. But then we got the WWE Championship match announcement, which is going to be Brock Lesnar one-on-one with Rey Mysterio. It's not going to be a triple threat between the three brands like we may have thought. Uh, I think coming into this event, a lot of people would have thought, and we talked about on the show before, that your reporting was that from the get-go, from months back, the plan was for Survivor Series to be a brand war. That was almost the entire uh, reasoning for having the draft in October was so that Survivor Series would be this brand versus brand type of show. And so instead of going with what would essentially be Brock Lesnar against The Fiend against Adam Cole, which is like playing a game of which one of these is not like the other, (laughs) uh, but instead of that type of triple threat, we get a strictly raw one-on-one match between Lesnar and Ray. How surprised were you at this development that, you know, we're getting some of those three-way brand war types of matches, but that for 
the WWE Championship, it's going to be a strictly one-on-one -on -one match uh, and not a triple threat involving anyone from the NXT brand or even the SmackDown brand for that matter. I was very surprised by that. That, as you said, the the plan as long as I have been aware of for the whole time that even I've been working for Sports Keto since June, that whole time the plan has been Raw will take on SmackDown. Now they've added NXT because obviously NXT is now live. It is now a third brand unto itself and it has the right to be there. It's earned that right, even though I think NXT is going to come out looking pretty bad at the end of it, potentially. When it comes to the WWE Championship match, maybe they're trying to avoid a situation where anyone is going to look bad. But it's it's so easy to consider that. Bray Wyatt and Brock Lesnar, that's a potentially incredible match that I'm sure they don't want to give away, but it would be so easy to write off by having someone there to eat the pin. And yes, Adam Cole shouldn't be losing in that event, but the night before, he's in war games. Also, he's Adam Cole. Getting beat up is what he does, and he does it better than anyone. So he's going to come out of a war games match against, well, as part of a team of five against a team of five. He's going to be demolished at the end of it, and then he walks into a match with Brock Lesnar and with Bray Wyatt. He loses nothing in eating the pin there absolutely nothing they still could have done that what this suggests to me is that they're trying to rush the Rey Mysterio storyline and just write it off and just get it done potentially it could be that Bray Wyatt picked up a like a niggling injury that's just potentially I'm not sure on that one I've not heard anything about it but I strongly suspect we're not going to see Wyatt versus Cole because that just doesn't seem to fit the bill. And there are no challenges for Wyatt. And there'd be no reason for Cole to answer a challenger. Because all the challengers will be in war games with him. So I'm not sure on this one. It came out of nowhere. I'm, I'm not going to say it'll be a bad match. I'm sure it'll be a tremendous match. These are the matches that these two are the best in. When one being Rey Mysterio is overwhelmed. Or when Brock Lesnar is throwing someone around. They can make this a tremendous piece of art. But you do have to wonder, are they trying to keep Lesnar and Wyatt apart? Well, no, I would assume, you know, heading into SmackDown, that if, if maybe if the plan is to give The Fiend a one-on-one -on -one match, you know, over on the SmackDown side, do you think that maybe they pivoted a little bit and maybe we'll see like a traditional four on four on four survivor series match between the three brands that it, where maybe adam cole is like the team captain of the nxt side uh and then maybe you know that probably gives something for like a seth rollins or a roman reigns or something to do to be the heads of their respective teams so instead of the one-on-one -on -one triple threats maybe they have made a pivot to where they're going to have a traditional survivor series type of elimination match they always have one of those traditional matches i would expect to see another one. I believe we're probably looking at if Adam Cole is in it, probably Cole, Bala, Gargano, Champer on one side. Really mix those face and heels. Um, and you're right, Seth Rollins needs something to do, a leadership role, great for him. Roman Reigns, same thing. If Bray Wyatt is in that match, I can imagine a situation where we end up being four on four on one, and then all the lights turn red, and he just demolishes everyone. I can imagine it, I can see it, and I would enjoy it. Well, since we mentioned Seth Rollins, uh, let's let's talk about him for just a second before we move on. You know, obviously he was in the main event against Adam Cole. They seem to be playing up this this storyline, which is probably a little bit of a take uh, on the real life situation and a lot of fans' perspective of you know where does Seth Rollins go from here after being defeated by the Fiend. What does his future hold? Kind of, you know, where does he go from this point forward? Lesnar is the champion of his brand. You know, he, he's lost the Universal Championship. He's not going to get a rematch, rematch for that. Uh, and we saw Triple H kind of interject himself, uh, you know, playing off of the, the past history of those two guys, maybe trying to lure Rollins over to the NXT side of things. Do you think that this angle is somewhat indicative, like I said, of 
kind of the real life situation with Rollins of where do we go with him? You know, if he's not, you know, the the captain of Team Raw uh, for Survivor Series, or if he doesn't really have a defined feud going into the pay per view. That, that this really is kind of a, a situation of Rollins kind of being in limbo, you know, at this point that I think me and you both agreed even before Crown Jewel that this feud with The Fiend really did nothing for Rollins as far as getting him more over uh, or, or making him a, a bigger star. And then obviously Crown Jewel, he eventually drops the title to The Fiend. So is this kind of... Uh, art imitating life a little bit with this limbo storyline uh, with Rollins and, and Triple H and kind of where he's going to go from here and what would you like to see Rollins do maybe going into Survivor Series and then coming out of that event it's a difficult one Seth is in a very difficult position right now and he's been put in that position through no fault of his own but the fans have turned we're no longer talking about the fans turning the fans have turned. In order to get that support back, he needs to be lined up against a real top class heel who can literally walk out there, blink a couple of times and have the entire crowd booing him and throwing things at him. They don't have that on Raw. Brock Lesnar gets cheers when he comes out because he's Brock Lesnar, he's a big deal. Uh, Baron Corbin would have been perfect. He's moved on and he's sort of overplayed that feud anyway. He's, he's on SmackDown, but we've already had more than enough of that for Seth Rollins. Drew McIntyre, not that guy. Samoa Joe, if he was fit, not that guy. We don't have heels that strong that are available. That's why people like Baron Corbin are so well respected in the field. So I think really they have to embrace the negative now. I'm not saying a heel turn per se, but I think he needs to have a bit more of a dark side, which they have been playing with quite a lot. I think potentially who they're lining up against him, again, is Triple H, just to be that absolute hateable, detestable heel to get the cheers back for Seth. We're going into the Royal Rumble. Traditionally, this is not a time when your top stars get much love. In the next couple of months, we'll see what the WrestleMania match is for Seth, uh, who that might be. But for now, there is a very, very, very low chance that he's going to win the Rumble. And he doesn't have any feuds lined up. Survivor Series is not a time to work on feuds because you obviously have the brand supremacy angle. So I'm really not sure what's next for Seth. Maybe a return to AJ Styles and a bit of a war for the US title. I'm not sure. And that's, as a big Seth Rollins fan, that's really quite disappointing. Yeah, I'd like to see something, you know, big for him. And I know a lot of times when things are going south, you know, for somebody, the answer is to always to, you know, seems to be to turn them heel. That's, you know, a lot of the fans want that, but... I actually think that would be a good direction for Seth at this point. I would love to see him make he'll turn, go back to the blonde streak in the hair, uh, you know, just just go back to to the that you know grimy, greasy Seth Rollins that we saw. Um, and I think Survivor Series could be a good opportunity to do that, make him the captain of Raw, and then have him you know double cross somebody and, and turn heel on the brand. Um, I think it may even be an opportunity for a double turn. I'm not really sure who, who the heel could be that could that could play the opposite of that that you could maybe turn face in the process of you know seth turning heel on them uh but i think that could maybe even be an opportunity where and then you create you know a new feud between those two guys but uh he needs something some type of of jolt to his personality and to his character there's a few things really stopping that heel turn though first and foremost if he turns heel the fans are going to cheer him because they want him to turn heel and when you want someone to turn heel, you cheer them, they're a failed heel. True. Secondly, even more importantly, do you turn Becky Lynch as well? That's interesting. But see, then if you leave her a face, I think there there's a whole vein of storylines that you could explore. Seth's a heel, Becky's still a face, maybe you know she doesn't understand why he's 
you know, doing this, or, you know, she's trying to bring him back to the, the light side of things, so maybe, you know, that opens up a storyline that, you know, between the two that the fans might actually want to see, not Seth Rollins playing, you know, Mr. Lynch, you know, Be Becky's boyfriend, but actually being in an angle with her that, that may have actually have some interest to the, to the casual fan. But he loves being Mrs. Lynch. He I, absolutely has a great time. He wears he the man's man t-shirts. Oh my gosh. He's he's genuinely so proud to be in that relationship. Like, as, it's a wonderful thing to see. As he should be. You know, Seth Rollins, the person, should be proud to be Becky Lynch's fiance. But Seth Rollins, the wrestling character, should not. Unless he, unless he has no intentions of ever being a top star ever again. If that's the case, he should just become Becky's manager and just walk her out to the ring and he can clap and, and tell everybody how proud he is. And just my opinion. That's just me. That's just one guy's opinion. We will see where they go with it. But we talked about the, uh, the other triple threat match we wanted to see. If, if anyone, I'm, and I'm sure they don't, but if anyone from WWE listens to this show... Tom Colohue's mental and physical well-being depends on the fact that you book AJ Styles versus Shinsuke Nakamura versus Roderick Strong in a triple threat at Survivor Series. So this I, is I'm, all true. I'm asking you as a friend of Tom's, I'm concerned for him, please book this match so that we know that he is going to be well off and we don't have to worry about him come Survivor Series time. It would be a tragedy. A tragedy. Also, everyone from WWE listens to us. Come on, you know better than that, Corey. Well, that's true. They just can't say it in public. But yeah, that's what it is. They they just can't say it in public. Yeah, that that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's move on to some other news and notes from the week. Um, I do want to backtrack with you. Like I said, I, I haven't talked to you since the Crown Jewel uh, event. But obviously, after the event, uh, a very interesting story uh, developed where the roster couldn't get back to the States in time for SmackDown, and you know that caused a lot of chaos uh, around the SmackDown show. But there's been some conflicting reporting about why exactly it was that the WWE superstars could not get out of Saudi Arabia. It was first reported that it was a simple mechanical failure of the plane. There was issues with the plane itself. They couldn't get off ground. They were, you know, stuck in a delay for five or six hours before they could, could take off. Then reports kind of start trickling out that maybe there was more to it than that. Uh, maybe there was a disagreement between Vince McMahon and the Saudi government. Um, there were reports that maybe the live feed uh, for Crown Jewel in the country had been cut because Vince McMahon and the, and the WWE were owed money for past shows that they hadn't been paid for. Um, and then it comes out that the WWE has extended their deal with Saudi Arabia that they're going to do even more shows than what they were originally contracted for. So a lot of rumor and innuendo uh, to steal a catchphrase. I'll ask you, and if people follow you on Twitter, you know, they've seen your reporting and your stance on things as far as reporting things that you can prove or can substantiate from your point of view. Give us just a rundown of, from your perspective or from from your information, what the situation in Saudi Arabia was with the talent roster not being able uh, to get back in, in the States uh, in the time that they originally thought. Okay. I woke up and I went to my day job on Friday morning. And this is UK time. And during that morning, I saw the first few messages on Twitter saying something has happened in Saudi Arabia. I believe it was from Fightful that I first saw it. Now, beyond what I've just said there, I'm not going to name any names. Because I'm going to be talking about colleagues in journalism outside of sports, Kida. A lot of people picked up on this story and a lot of people were suddenly talking to sources who had this story, which is interesting considering I reached out to a lot of people and for a long time got nothing because people were in transit. People were on a plane without Wi-Fi. Vince McMahon, for example, was flying and everyone who was with him was already flying. The access wasn't there. So I'm not sure how connected a lot of my colleagues are 
they could say clearly a lot more well connected than me if they could reach people who were constantly in transit. I got a message quite late on, and this was backed up by a few further messages, saying that there had been um, problems with the flight. No details were given. One person told me there was a fueling issue. And beyond that, all I was told, there were travel problems, a problem with the flight and the flight company, and people were back at the hotel. I reported this around half an hour later. The WWE put out a report saying that there were mechanical issues. People were back at the hotel. Okay, there we go. That's the issue. As far as I could tell, that's the whole story. A lot's come out since, but a lot's come out since it doesn't have factual backing. I have seen some people hell-bent on a crusade to punish the WWE for this Saudi Arabia deal. Obviously, the last time we spoke, I said I would not be watching Saudi Arabia, uh, sorry, Crown Jewel in Saudi Arabia. I only tuned in for the women's match because I do believe that is a sign of progress and it is worth celebrating. Did not tune in for the rest of it because that is not worth celebrating. I am not a fan of this deal. But I do believe in the progress they're making, so credit to them for that. But I'm still not a fan of this deal. Uh, all journalists are colleagues of mine. I will say that on that, and that is it. But a lot of people were coming out with so uh, we just it, these little crusades and missions, as it were, to find out more, find out more, find out more. Fair enough. Journalists should be on missions to find out more. However. You only present the facts. The role of a journalist is not to muddy the water. It's not to feed assumption. The role of a journalist is a clear-cut fact so that people know what they are supporting. That did not happen. Speculation ran rife, and people were making assumptions based on actual fact. So they looked at the accounts and they saw a 60 million payer pay-in that came in and they decided this is where it was this is what it was this is this this is that oh the saudi arabian government did this the amount of reports that came out that had no factual backing whatsoever now i've been chasing this i have not sat idle i have tried to find fact behind what other people have been saying and i can't find fact and the more time goes on, the more it seems like the fact is what I'd already reported. So I've had people coming to me and saying to me, why haven't you reported this? Why haven't you reported this? This person has, you should talk to them. This person has actual sources. You don't have sources because otherwise you'd know this. I can't find any fact. And nobody has presented me with any either. The only fact, to my knowledge... And the only fact behind anything that's been reported, the WWE chartered flight had mechanical problems in Saudi Arabia. They didn't get back in time. I think some of what's being presented is a little farcical. The idea that, oh, the stream was just cut. It, 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 it's not up to Vince McMahon to, to cut all TV everywhere. He doesn't have that sort of power. Also, Vince McMahon... He's big on money. He likes money. And I don't think he would have gone to Saudi Arabia in the first place if he was owed hundreds of millions of dollars for two shows. He just wouldn't have gone. And then the idea that you can charter a plane in five minutes? No, that's not how it works. There are so many things to consider. First and foremost, how packed was the airport? How does air traffic control work? How many flights were going out at the time? Did they need to move airport? There are so many different things. You consider only so many people got out on a separate chartered flight. Certainly a chartered plane would have had more seats than the 20 that are reported to have gone. Maybe that's all the room they could find. So, that is what I know about Saudi Arabia. There were mechanical problems with the plane, people had to deplane, and then back to the hotel, and then flew when they got the chance. 
I've been unable to find any fact supporting anything except for that. What do you make, just to be devil's advocate here, what do you make of some of the tweets that some of the WWE superstars themselves put out referencing things like being left behind, um, you know, that they were in need of thoughts and prayers, that, you know, things were, you know, kind of getting dicey once they got home, you know, a lot of people posted things, you know, thankful to be home and, you know, again, things that, you know, never leaving someone behind and, you know, and family comes first and, and these types of things that would appear to at least have played into the narrative of there was something more going on than just mechanical issues. Or was this simply a case of, yeah, there were wrestlers that were ticked off that some people got to leave on a charter flight with Vince McMahon and, and, and some of his, you know, other business associates while the rest of them had to wait an extra six hours to, to get a flight home. And it was simply a case of they were ticked off that they had to stay there and wait while the boss got to go home. You know, so e even though as whatever opinion you may have of that, it wasn't as evil or diabolical as well the boss jumped ship and, and got out of the country and just kind of left the rest of his employees there you know with their fingers crossed that they would be able to get out of the country i think we have to remember that these are human beings and it's possible that they didn't know the whole story it's possible that they picked up their phones and they checked their twitter and they saw and they saw what certain people were saying and wondered if it was mechanical issues. Maybe that got into their head. Maybe they were having a joke. Maybe they weren't sure and they were legitimately worried. These are human beings. They're entitled to those emotions. I think with, with some of them, it's quite clear that there was some tongue-in-cheek humour. Look at Lou Gallows, perfect example. Uh, sorry, Carl Anderson, I believe it was, who said about having an extra pool. My mistake. Um... Some of it was definitely tongue-in-cheek. Some of it was... I would imagine some people were very thankful to be home. It's a long day to be stuck up there. It's a, a bad situation. But then you've got people like Natalia coming in, stating what happened from her point of view. You've got AJ Styles stating what happened from his point of view. It's... Until someone comes out and says, this happened, who would know? We can't really say, because I doubt someone who was on the plane, there were issues, they had to leave the plane. I doubt they would be able to say the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia specifically came down and made sure we couldn't get off the ground. I doubt they would be privy to that conversation. Last thing before we move on from this topic, and, and just because it kind of adds into this point you're making of people kind of filling in the rest of the story, you know, taking maybe certain facts that are reported and then kind of drawing their own conclusions and connecting their own dots about the facts. Seth Rollins on Twitter uh, has gotten into a, a very public uh, Twitter beef, I guess, or discussion, argument, whatever you want to call it, with another well-known wrestling journalist or reporter, um, out of respect for you, I won't mention his name unless you want to specifically mention him, but about uh, an apparent, you know, talent meeting that took place before Raw on Monday and that Rollins, you know, got up and made a speech to the rest of the roster and uh, talked to them about not talking about company dealings and happenings on social media and keeping those types of things to their self, obviously alluding to the situation in, in Saudi Arabia with the travel. Um, and Seth Rollins has basically come out and said that never happened, uh, that he never made a speech, he never spoke to the talent, and that everything that this reporter was reporting and saying to be fact was a bold-faced lie. And like I said, it's right there on Twitter if you want to go look at it and see the thread and, and see who it is I'm talking about that uh, Seth Rollins was interacting with. Do you think that we're getting to a point now, and we, and we kind of had this discussion before uh, about wrestling journalism, quote-unquote, and reporting, that a lot of this stuff and this, this connecting the dots and sensationalizing stories 
are going to get to the point where now we're actually going to have wrestlers and talents speaking out and calling people out by name that, you know, their reports and stories are just made up fiction. I mean, I know we have a lot of people in the business that, that claim that that's all dirt sheets are anyway, is just people, you know, sensationalizing things and, and sometimes just making stuff up. Uh, and like you said, there aren't many that necessarily just stick to the facts of what they know because a lot of them probably just don't want to admit that they just don't know the whole story. But do you, I guess, for, have you seen this this thread on Twitter involving Seth I Rollins? I have and, seen this. I have also seen the one that uh, was posted a handful of minutes ago. Are you aware of that one? Uh, I'm a, I, will, I will read it out. Um, from Seth Rollins, I will leave the first two words out because they refer to the name. My problem is that you're spreading complete lies. I gave no speech. I said nothing before, during, or after the meeting. So either you or your source is full of it. Either way, it's a bold-faced lie, and I kindly ask you to quit pushing it. Yeah, that's what I was referring to. Like I said, when he, yeah. Seth Rollins has come out and just and flatly denied that any of that happened. Yeah, we are very much at the time now where everyone is protecting themselves a little bit more. This goes for the wrestlers. This also goes for the journalists. People are being a lot more defensive because that's how the world is at the minute. People are more defensive because people are more divided. I think the talent are entirely within their rights to question the reporting. I think if you're going to be a reporter, you have to report facts. Now, if if the journalist in question has gone out and has checked with multiple sources and confirmed it in many different ways, then they're also right to publish the story. I think the better move for both of these parties is to talk to each other instead of talking it out in public. Now, if one side won't listen, we have an issue. But I think we're at a point now where this could be much simpler. Sit down, have the conversation. That would be much easier for everyone. If people could just stop being defensive and have the talk, everything would be a lot easier. I have to agree with you there. Uh, we'll we'll leave that topic there and, and move on. Uh, I don't really have a, a witty transition to, to get us from, from there to the our last topic, but uh, I did want to get your opinion on uh, something that a little bit more off the, the beaten path, um, something to do with impact wrestling. Um uh, Sammy Callahan just recently became their world champion, and if you've been following their program, uh, it would appear that his next big program for the championship is going to be with Tessa Blanchard. Uh, now, these two have already had a match uh, on an Impact pay-per-view before, uh, but this next match that they would potentially have would again be for Impact's world championship, and a lot of fans would think that if this match happens, that Tessa could end up with the championship. I wanted to get your opinion because, you know, people that listen to the show and follow you on Twitter know that you are uh, and have always been a big supporter of women's wrestling, you know, of the women's evolution and and the strides that they've made in, in that division and the way that they've pre- been presented uh, in wrestling here lately. So I wanted to get your thoughts on this potential intergender match uh, and intergender wrestling is not necessarily a new concept, you know, other than impact or really haven't seen it uh, on, you know, a, a national stage uh, other than in impact. But uh, if this match between Sammy Callahan and Tessa Blanchard were to take place and if Tessa were to become the world champion, what would be, what is your stance on, you know, intergender wrestling and intergender angles in wrestling, uh, just from a wrestling fan's perspective, from the perspective of watching it and suspending your belief a little bit, you know, in order to accept it and accept what's going on. And what would be your feelings on a woman actually holding a major promotions world championship? I would have absolutely no issue with that, which I doubt surprises you. There is 
nothing wrong with intergender wrestling. You certainly have someone like Tessa Blanchard. She can certainly compete. I would also love to see Rhea Ripley take on Drew McIntyre. Just throwing that out there. If WWE and all the many, many WWE producers who definitely listen to us, if they want to take that forward, by all means credit me at the beginning of every match that they have. But um, like everything, it's right when it's done right. I believe firmly in having divisions. I like that there is a women's division. I like that there is a men's division. I like that there is a tag division. And I think when you get two people thrown together into a tag team, it sort of weakens that division a bit. So I think it has to be done right. I think the the right people have to be chosen. I I don't want to see um, people who aren't necessarily comfortable in that environment competing in that way. Um, and I, I don't want to see men squashing women. I don't want to see that because that's just an unnecessary match to put on. But at the same time, I have very fond memories of China versus Jericho. They were some great matches. Two competitors who worked well together. And that's all you want from wrestling. You said that if you follow my Twitter, you'll see I'm a big proponent of women's wrestling. Very true. Also a big fan of Tessa Blanchard. She has a very dominant persona and she and Sammy Callahan are clearly very comfortable working together clearly they are having a great time and they are really drawing eyes to impact at a time when its product has never been better in my opinion I think when it comes to actually holding the championship there are a few things it depends on I, I, I've been told that Tessa's uh, contract doesn't run too much longer so I think it may be if she doesn't sign a new contract she doesn't get the championship I can't blame them for that I I think if you can't guarantee someone's still going to be there don't put your world championship on them it's fair enough really but either way it's going to be a marquee match a lot of people are going to tune in I'm excited to watch it I don't get enough time to watch Impact but I've managed to catch what I can and I think she'd be a very good world champion as in fact is Sammy Callahan. It's it's definitely a, a different time uh, in the business for sure. And, and I said this this type of match or having a you know a woman world champion would definitely be indicative of that. All right, and then uh, last thing we'll talk about, uh, as you alluded to right at our open, uh, you know, alluding to full gear from AEW will be coming up as well this month, and that show is going to be headlined by. Uh, Chris Jericho, AEW World Champion, defending his title against Cody Rhodes. This is a match that probably a lot of AEW fans have been waiting for. You can tell if you've been following AEW Dynamite and some of the vignettes and things that they've been doing with Cody lately, like uh, the limo interview that he did with Tony Schiavone and, uh, and things of that nature, that this really appears to be something that Cody is really putting his heart and head into uh, this match and, and this angle with Jericho um, and as professional as Jericho is uh, and a wrestling historian like he is you know that he probably is doing the same especially considering that it's with Cody you know son of Dusty Rhodes and all of the history that that is built up in that uh, and and this is really the first time that we've seen Cody in a prime main event spot in the company that he helped found and, and helped build so what do you think of this uh, Cody Jericho angle? And when we get to full gear, how do you see this one coming down? Do you, do you think that uh, Jericho retains? Do you think that Cody takes the title? If he does take the title, will there be fan backlash because of people saying that, well, he's just booking himself uh, to be the champion, just like his dad did and got some backlash way back uh, in yesteryear for, for doing the same thing in his territory? So... How do you see this match? A lot of interesting angles and facets to it, I think. I think for a first big championship program, it's been pretty solid. A lot of, like I said, the, the wind has been taken out their sails a little bit by what's been happening with WWE. So they needed to have a program that would definitely carry forwards and really keep it going. I think Cody loses. I think that's the right move. I think the JWO are going to be involved in some way there. 
don't know if I've mentioned them as a JWO on this podcast before, but that's how I've always thought of the Inner Circle, the Jericho World Order. They always do the run-ins to end the show, same as New World Order. It's, uh, it's an effective story. Why not tell it again? I like it. I think I think the next challenger for Jericho, who actually have a chance of winning the belt, will be Moxley. I don't think anyone will have a chance until then. But for a first program with two of the biggest stars that AEW has to offer, it's been the right way to go about it. Some of the build hasn't been perfect, um, but it's been exciting. And that's it. It might not have made the, the perfect sort of sense, Jericho appearing and having a branded microphone, despite the fact he was there waving his tickets. Bit of a weird moment, but it was exciting. And really, that's what AEW are pitching for. It doesn't all make perfect sense. It's a bit scrappy, but that's okay because it's exciting. So I think they've got this right. I do think Jericho is going to retain, but I also do think it's going to be a very good match. Well, man, we have run the gamut of topics here tonight, uh, and I appreciate Tom being back with me on the show. Uh, Make sure that you follow him on Twitter, at Callahue, to continue to get all of his uh, wrestling reporting uh, and an emphasis on reporting and insider info over at his Twitter account. You can also check out his work and reports for SportsKeeda at SportsKeeda.com. If you're so inclined, you can follow me on Twitter at Corey Guns. Make sure that you share, like, retweet, whatever you can do to get uh, the word out about the SportsKeeda and Dropkick Discussions podcast right here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. And we will see you guys next time on the Dropkick Discussions podcast presented by Sports Kita. See you guys next time.